So hello everyone. Uh, today uh, I've prepared a um, little uh, presentation for you guys about the introduction to GraphQL. So let's uh, start our presentation by defining two major problems that uh, we as front-end developers or even back-end developers uh, face uh, on our daily basis. So uh, the two problems I want to talk about are overfitching and underfitching. So these are the problems we face when we are uh, developing uh, client applications for different APIs. So overfitching is fetching too much data, uh, meaning there is data in response that you don't necessarily use. Uh, your application ultimately uses more bandwidth for uh, what it doesn't need, and data source uses more power, uh, more processing power to provide you with something you won't necessarily use, right? So the diagram for that is kind of like this. Uh, consider the API, API A, uh, which returns the following JSON. See, we have different properties here. We have the country, city, temperature, temperature format, user status, user IP, et cetera, et cetera, right? And what we actually need in the client are the uh, country, city, temperature, or the temperature format, and we don't need others, right? But we are actually uh, downloading more data uh, than we actually need or require for our application to run smoothly. So this is called overfetching. So we are overfetching data. The other problem we face when working with APIs, specifically RESTful APIs, is underfetching. And what it means is underfetching is not having enough data with a call to an endpoint, forcing you to call a second endpoint or n number of endpoints. I'm pretty sure you guys have experienced, it, experienced this before. Uh, we have multiple APIs. We need to aggregate uh, the responses in our client application. So we have API A, which only returns the temperature, and the API B, which returns the country and the city for us. So if, for example, um, consider we have a weather application, we need both of these APIs. Our backend works this way, so we must follow that. And we need both of these APIs for uh, our client states, uh, client states to be perfect, right? So we need to make two APIs, two separate APIs in parallel. Um, and things get more complex when there are APIs that are dependent, uh, dependent on each other. For example, uh, there are multiple backend services and there is no gateway for you to actually be able to call once in one round trip and get what you need. So you basically need to call API A to get some sort of ID and you provide this to API B to get the information you need. And this is called underfishing. In a perfect world, the API provides us with the only properties we need as a client in one round trip. So there is no um, excess uh, processing power wasted on aggregating the, the, the data that we won't be needing from the database. And um, there, will be, there will be less uh, bandwidth used at the end. So here, uh, GraphQL uh, really in, um, shines, right? This is where the GraphQL really shines. GraphQL is a query language and a runtime for APIs developed by Facebook. And uh, there are three uh, key features that the GraphQL has. One being efficient data retrieval, two flexibility, and the third one is the developer-friendly approach that it provides you with. So the why behind the GraphQL uh, is actually uh, related to the uh, concepts I just talked about. Limitation of the traditional RESTful API, such as overfishing and underfishing of data, making it complex for engineers to develop rich uh, UIs or client applications easily. So, um, you know, in Facebook, there's a really good documentary about the GraphQL in Honeypot on YouTube. You, you should watch it. And uh, they say we have these complex data structures that we used uh, um, RESTful APIs for, and it was uh, slow, it was hard to maintain, it was hard to develop. It was this giant you know, ball of mud kind of APIs that 
it was so entangled, so recursive, that was so hard for us to actually manage to build. So they um, actually three people in the Facebook uh, came together and built this amazing technology. And after that, uh, the community of open source uh, continued their uh, efforts and made it available for all the languages that exist. So uh, let's talk about how a GraphQL can how we can make GraphQL work, right? So uh, the first step is to define a schema, okay? A GraphQL schema is, is, is a contract, right? So the GraphQL language, it has a um, SDL, right? A schema definition language. And it is used uh, to first define your graph, define what data you want to provide and define what data your backend or backends provide, right? So you have a bunch of servers, you want to, uh, you know, uh, make GraphQL server on top of all of them and make the data that is inside those servers available to the consumers. So you first need to uh, build the contract or the schema for your GraphQL server. And the second uh, step is you'll have to um, set up a GraphQL server. Once you have the schema files, you need to pull uh, different libraries depending on what you use. For example, I, I've uh, prepared the example in Golang. I will show you guys. But you can also use Node.js. You can also use Ruby. Uh, all these languages are, uh, the GraphQL server implementation are available for all these languages. So you wouldn't necessarily be uh, facing any problems there. So it is easy. You spin, a, spin up a, a GraphQL server. And you connect your data sources. So once you um, <clears throat> introduce your schemas, you have to introduce resolvers for those schemas. And you have to say, for example, we have a schema called to do. Uh, where is this to do coming from? So this is just the data in our application graph. Where is this coming from? Uh, where can we actually fetch this kind of uh, entity on our graph? So you set up resolvers. And in your favorite programming language on the server side, you develop uh, code to actually tell the GraphQL where to fetch those uh, real uh, life data. It can be either from a database, it can be from a RESTful server somewhere. It doesn't matter. You just have to say it. It can, it can also be in memory. So I will show you in a minute. So the next step for making GraphQL work is to define and execute queries and mutations. So there's, uh, there are two concepts, uh, one, one being queries and the other one being mutations. Once you um, develop your schema, the schema just says uh, how entities relate to each other. Uh, and queries actually uh, provide the clients with those uh, specific uh, graphs they, they need. And the mutations is what we use to actually alter our uh, data sources and actually add uh, additional entities or uh, graph data to uh, our data sources. So uh, the next step uh, can be handling authorization and authentication. So the GraphQL doesn't provide built-in authentication or authorization. You have to uh, implement this yourself in your GraphQL server. Uh, this is kind of an advanced topic, but we won't be getting to this uh, today. But the next step would be handling errors. So just like any other application, uh, you would encounter errors and you'll, uh, you're going to have to handle all those missing data, unexpected errors from your data sources. So you have to uh, actually be able to uh, handle all of that in your GraphQL server definition. The next step would be testing and optimizing. So there are a couple of problems you would uh, face uh, for um, setting on GraphQL um, server and graphs. And when you uh, expose these kind of uh, servers to the uh, wilderness, so you're going to face those problems. Uh, one being the n plus one problem. So uh, when you have a list of entities and each entities uh, need to um, fetch other data, this is where you get the M plus one problem. And you have to make sure that these problems don't uh, arise in your application. 
uh, when you're trying to develop uh, GraphQL uh, applications. So uh, as the famous Linus Torvald says, talk is cheap, show me the code. I'm going to show you an example I built using Golang and Vue.js um, that uses uh, GraphQL as the, uh, the main uh, data source for the application. So let's, let's jump into the code. I actually have two, um, I actually have two uh, folders, one being client, which is a your uh, good old typical Vue.js uh, application. The other one is server. So this is where the server uh, lies, resides, and we can run them both and we can play around with it. So the first one, I want to cd to client and run the client application. I want to add another shell here and cd to server and go run server.go. Okay, so let me explain to you how I implemented the server first. I think that would be really helpful. So we have a uh, typical Golang um, project right here. Uh, we have a folder called graph. Uh, I actually use the uh, GQL gen uh, library for the, uh, it, it is one of the most famous uh, GraphQL libraries, uh, Golang implementations that I use. So it basically, uh, you define the schema for it in a, a schema.graphqls file. So what I said here, we have a bunch of to-dos. Uh, so GraphQL has a rich type system, just like TypeScript. You can use it to define types, merge types, uh, you can define fragments and use it across the queries and mutations. So uh, there's a huge um, benefit to these kind of rich type systems that we can use. And it uh, minimizes our uh, bugs uh, and uh, possible mistakes, right? So we have a type to do, uh, which has an ID, text, done, and user. So this user is actually another type that has ID and name. So these are our entities, these are our graphs. So we know that to-dos, uh, one user has uh, many to-dos. So this is what we get from uh, this kind of graph here. And we can say that, right, we have a query here. Uh, our query just uh, returns an array of to-dos. And we have a mutation that allows us to create to-dos and we input uh, a typical to-do the input is just the type of new to-do, and the return will be the to-do that we just made, right? So this is just a simple uh, represent, uh, presentation of the uh, GraphQL server that we, we just implemented. So we implement this, and the Golang just, uh, it uses code generation. I won't get, in, get into that part because it's out, out of the scope of our represent, um, presentation today. But uh, it builds these uh, resolvers for us. And it makes resolvers for our entities that we are using. And uh, it delegates us the duty of, you know, actually implementing these resolvers. Where, is, uh, where are these to-dos coming from? So what I did uh, was actually pretty easy. I just I just said that I want to keep to-dos as an array of to-dos just in memory for uh, demonstration purposes. And I don't want it to do something crazy like connecting to it to a database or calling another HTTP. Uh, so I just said that, yeah, we have a, a resolver. We have a bunch of to-dos in memory. And if we ever create one, just add that appended to the to-dos. And if you want wanted to do, just return the to-do. So these are the resolvers. So it uh, takes care of both a mutation and query at the same time. And after that, when you're done doing this, if we actually go to the server.go file, we see that uh, we imported a typical HTTP uh, router here. And we used a couple of things here. We uh, imported the graphical playground. So this is the graphical playground. This is actually built by Facebook themselves as a, a kind of playground and uh, a fun front end to test out your ideas with GraphQL and actually be able to uh, see the schema without uh, actually browsing through the code itself. So. If I just go to the uh, local, so let me just open up 
local uh, local host 8080. This is the graphical uh, client that we are using to inspect our GraphQL server. So here we can execute queries, we can execute mutations and see the result in real time. After we checked all of this, we can actually use these queries in our real application uh, to be actually useful, right? So this is just kind of logging for our GraphQL. It's nothing, it's nothing crazy. Uh, we can actually sh uh, show Documentation Explorer here and, it's, and it tells us what types we have and we can quickly skim through the types we uh, implemented. So I'm just gonna remove this and say a query get to do's, right? So we're gonna uh, create a new query that returns to do. So this, is, this has IntelliSense and it has autocomplete. We can say we want the to do's. Uh, what in the to do's do we want, right? We have to specify because in GraphQL, what you see is what you get, right? It's not overfetching, it's not underfetching, it's just what you need. So what do we have in to do's, right? So I'm, I'm, I can I can say we have ID and we have we should have other things. Yeah, we have text done user, right? So I'm gonna just get the IDs and text and I can run this query and we have nothing because our to do uh, uh, to do's repository is actually in memory and it is now empty. So we have to create a mutation for it, right? Mutation create to do. Uh, actually, let me just, yeah. And we can say create to do and we already uh, in our GraphQL schema, we already declared this type of mutation for us. So this is where it reads what it can. So we say we create a to-do with an input, just like our schema. And in our input, we specify, what do we specify? Let me uh, trigger the, um, let me trigger the autocomplete here. Tell me what's inside. Yeah, one text. <clears throat> so we say, for example, Hello world, okay? And the other one is user ID. So we have to specify user ID. For example, I say, um, if this just changes, okay. We say one, two, three, okay? And this is just our, it, if in uh, RESTful terms, this is just the body for our post request. So what do we get in, the, in return? I want to get the ID and text in return. So when I do this, um, and because we have a rich type system, uh, it says that it should be a string, right? So I have to make it a string. So I just made a bug and GraphQL captured it. And we have we, now we have less bugs thanks to the rich type system that GraphQL provides. Oops, okay. So this is a bracket, so everything's well, right now, I'm gonna just run this mutation real quick. So I, I run it once. Let's run the query now, get to do. So we have one to do uh, inserted in our memory. So this is working. We can add a bunch of other uh, items just to make sure it works, making sure it does work. I'm gonna run this. Yeah, it's, like it's successfully did. And the third one. Okay, now the third one is inserted. So if we get all the to do's, we get the, uh, the three to do's that we, that we just inserted. So this is just a demonstration in the graphical um, playground that we have here. So what if uh, we want to use it in a real world uh, VJS application? Let's hop back to the client. We have a typical Vue.js application here, nothing too crazy. I uh, installed the necessary uh, clients, Apollo clients for GraphQL. It's an amazing uh, client. Actually, Tanistack uh, supports GraphQL, but Apollo is more matured and it has more features. So I decided to go with that. 
in the app, uh, in the main, uh, when we're creating this, uh, when we're creating our app before mounting, we need to uh, provide this Apollo client that we are uh, actually uh, creating here. So we provide this uh, client as a dependency for all of our application to use. Whenever we are using GraphQL client, this is, this is already provided. We don't need to uh, generate the dependencies on the fly. So this is great. So we actually create an HTTP link, we create a memory cache, we create the client, and we provide all of that in one Apollo client uh, variable to the whole application. And for example, in this instance, if I open this, right, <clears throat> this is the client application. We use the uh, GQL GraphQL tag library. It, it kind of reminded me of the React site components. You get to use uh, backticks and you can use your queries just like you did in the graphical playground here. And you uh, tell it what you want. And uh, it actually, it's, it's kind of a built um, factory pattern. It generates a, a full fledged query for you and you can use, you can just use it. Uh, by the variable name in the use query that is imported from the Apollo composable. So Apollo uh, actually has a great support for Vue 3, so no, no worries about that. And the use query returns uh, three, uh, a bunch of, actually a bunch of properties that we can use. It has a bunch of callbacks, it has a bunch of options, it, it gives you a bunch of cool you know, features like reset, refetch, et cetera, et cetera just like tennis that gives you. And I actually used it uh, in the result. Uh, so I just wanna, this is basically what I'm doing. I'm just running this query and rendering it to the, uh, as a, a raw text to the uh, template. So this is what we just, uh, if, you, if you recall, we just, hello world, we just added hello world, making sure it does work. And the third one, right? So. It gives us the exact uh, data as an array of to-dos. And for a cherry on top, so uh, you might ask yourself, so this is kind of hard because how do I uh, know for sure that my query is working properly, right? So in the graphical playground, you had IntelliSense and you had auto-correction auto and you had all that cool stuff. So what do we need here? We actually need this file a Apollo config.js file, right? So I'm just going to go ahead and open, uh, open the client. Because I think I need to open the VS Code instance inside. Just going to rerun. <clears throat> just going to rerun the server. Go run server.go. Okay, we have the server up and running. We, we run the client. Okay, we are set. Here we just say that uh, uh, we have a we have a client. We can have multiple clients, but we won't get into that. We say that in every Vue.js, JS, and TS files, if you see these uh, GraphQL-like queries run IntelliSense on them by uh, providing them with the GraphQL server. So when we are providing the GraphQL server to this Apollo uh, GraphQL extension, it actually fetches all the schemas that we uh, are defining in our backend and it uses for the autocomplete and other uh, cool uh, developer experience things in our writing to our editor, okay? so. Here, I, I just said that use this uh, config here. And yeah, this is this is cool. This is this is working. So I may need to rerun these once again because I think I restarted and the memory flushed, right? So I just need to create one to do, see if it works. Yeah, it, it did. And here I prefetched it. Okay, so let's see the also complete in the uh, in the editor here. So I'm I'm just gonna go ahead and remove all of this. Okay. Query <clears throat> get to do's. 
All right. So let's see the Apollo st uh, status here. Show status. <clears throat> uh okay apollo config module exports client service everything looks good to me uh you're missing your misconfigured okay oh all right i think i just need to remove this bar <clears throat> let's see again apollo status okay I think this was correct. I don't know why that isn't. Error loading a schema. So what if we Apollo reload the schema? And now, yes, it did. I don't know what happened, but it was just a small mistake, I think. So query to do's. And now we can have our schema right into our uh, editor, just like the graphical interface. So we have to do, we have ID for that, we have text, we have user, what in the user we have, we have ID and we have name. So we can actually use all of that here. Uh, and it actually adds that bit of, you know, you don't, you don't need to uh, build uh, types based on the um, open API specifications anymore. You don't need to uh, declare your types uh, from scratch just by reading the Swagger or something like that, right? You get your types inside the browser, and this is the up to uh, the most up to date types. So you don't have to worry about uh, rebuilding your types and all of that stuff. So this is really cool. And we get to dos, and in the to dos we want the text and we want the ID, right? Okay. It has no problems. We can actually come here, reload this, and boom, we get this. Okay, so for example, let's let's say that uh, there's a change and we won't be needing the IDs anymore, right? The only thing we need to do is to remove the ID and refetch it. So the ID is gone and we did nothing crazy here. Yeah, uh, that's it. So this is the uh, really fast and furious uh, Vue 3 client demo we just did. Uh, we talked about what GraphQL is, what problems does it solve, what the schemas are, what mutations, uh, queries, and resolvers are. We implemented basic uh, GraphQL server in Golang, and we showed it in Vue.js. And as a cherry on top, we showed the great uh, developer experience you can get from using GraphQL. Thank you very much.